<clears throat> Good evening. Welcome to the Watchman Report with Walter Lovett. Tonight we are taking a brief detour from our Mapping the End of Days series, and we are instead speaking about a well-known biblical passage found in Scripture. We will continue our discussion about the seven seals as well as revisiting our teaching on the second exodus in the coming days. Tonight, before we get started, I wanted to remind you to sign up for my newsletter. It's free of charge, and you can do so by going to my link tree. The link is in my bio. All right. Hey, howdy. <laughs> All right. So Civil War, the Beast System, Leviathan, and the Second Exodus. These are some topics that I will be discussing in the coming days. Um, I will be releasing my teachings on Rumble due to censorship. Uh, if you want to hear these things, you can please subscribe to my Rumble. The link is also in my bio to my link tree. All right, the title of tonight's lesson is The Meaning of Neither Greek Nor Jew, or Jew Nor Greek, however you want to say it. Uh, the passage comes from Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. And we are just going to jump right into it. Tonight is going to be... Um, I'm just going to shoot from the hip tonight, and I, I don't want anybody to, to leave upset. I'm really hoping that this teaching kind of um, clarifies some things because there's a lot of people on both sides that don't really have um, the correct understanding of what salvation means for neither for Greek or Jew. And so I want to break it down. Um, there's some misconception among Christians, but then there's also some misconception amongst Hebrew Israelites. So I definitely want to talk about this because it's so important. All right, let's jump right in. Um, there are many problematic verses in the Bible, and this, this one has most recently become one of them. Before the popular rise of the Hebrew Israelites, people would just, they would just take this verse for what it means which is basically, it doesn't matter who you are, as long as you are in Messiah, you are one. However, the Hebrew Israelites have introduced, introduced an interesting and albeit challenging doctrine. It is one that is not easily overcome by those who are not weaned from milk. So you can't be, uh, you know, you can't really be a baby believer to, to, if you really want to grasp this. It's, it's a little hard if you want to grasp this and you're a baby believer, okay? So people that aren't weaned from the milk aren't quite going to understand this. Now, Christians and Hebrew Israelites both teach vastly different things on this. However, in order to get to the truth, we must see what Scripture says. All right, so first we're going to take a look at the traditional uh, belief uh, and dive into... I guess we'll take a look at the traditional Gentile belief, and then we're going to dive into what the Hebrew Israelites teach. Then we're going to test them against scriptures and see what the Bible really says. So to break this down, I'm going to go over neither Jew nor Greek, what the traditional belief is. Then I'm going to go over the Hebrew Israelite belief, and then I'm going to tell you what the Bible teaches, just to kind of break that down in bullet points. All right, so the traditional belief of Christians with regard to Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 is that there is neither Jew nor Gentile. So there is no national identity as all become one united in Christ. Hence there is no need to talk about Israel or whether one is a Gentile. The Messiah makes us makes us now have a new identity. That's the Christian belief, okay? Now this would appear to make sense since we learned about a loving God in Christianity, they teach you about a loving God who loves everybody, right? So verses like Galatians 3.28 are a no-brainer to Christians. And those who don't have, I guess, a deeper scriptural understanding or context of the truth, they just go with it. And they would just believe that it is common sense since God, again, loves everybody. Now, the problem with this is that Christians forget about all the atrocities that the Gentiles have committed. And they forget about, they also forget about the promises that God made because of the people. Okay, so God made a covenant with Israel. Israel disobeyed. They broke that covenant, but God didn't forget about them. Whereas in Christianity, there's a popular belief that they are forgotten about. However, when we read verses like Jeremiah 31 37, which says, Thus saith Yahuwah, if 
heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith Yahuwah. Now, anyone who has been able to, has anybody been able to measure heaven? No, no man, no woman, no child, nobody, no animal has been able to measure heaven. Um, has there been a report of anyone searching out the foundations of the earth, seeing how it was constructed or built, you know, its dimensions? No. So th what this verse basically is telling you is that no matter what Israel has done, they are not forsaken. They are not his forsaken people. Now, Jeremiah 51, 5 kind of says something similar. It says, For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his Elua, of Yahuwah of hosts, thou their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Okay, so again, he's telling you, you know, this is how it is. This is what's going on. So the argument, and I'll just, you know, I'll just throw out a, typical argument the argument that quote no need there's no need to talk about israel this this argument presents another major problem with this doctrine and we know this as replacement theology okay so replacement theology is a doctrine that you know whether it's on purpose or whether it's by accident it essentially seeks to trivialize the people of the most high and to ignore all the prophecies about his people unfortunately christians take it and they say, you know, we're all one in Christ under the umbrella of Christianity. And they kind of have the tendency to to say that Israel is of little or no, no importance. But the Most High is telling us through Scripture that that's not the case. They, you know, they're never going to cease to be his nation of people. Now, Psalms 83 tells us about the confederacy of the nations. Um, there was a prophecy in Psalms 83, and it tells you that there would be a push to essentially erase or to re replace his people. Um, now, on the other hand, on the other foot, so to speak, the Hebrew Israelites have gone into the meaning of the Greek and they have coupled it with historical facts. So the Christians are saying one thing based on this scripture passage. Christians, a lot of Christians, not all, but a lot of Christians believe that Israel is done away with. Israel dropped the ball, you know, they're done. On the other hand, the Hebrew Israelites have gone in and they've researched what the, the Greek root words are. They've, you know, they've gone and collected um, historical facts and they have come up with their own thing. And unfortunately, a lot of Hebrew Israelites say that only Hebrew Israelites can be saved. And so this is where they get it from. I'm going to go over it and tell you, tell you about it. And then, again, we're going to go back to Scripture, tell you what Scripture says and what, what it means. Okay, so the meaning of Greek is a Hellene. Like when you're speaking about a Greek person or the Greek empire, you, say, you would say Hellene. Um, or a plural word is like Grecian. Okay, so what that means is a Hellene was an inhabitant of Hellas. By extension, it was a Greek-speaking person, especially a non-Jew or a Gentile. The Greek call, called their, their country Hellas. So if you were a citizen of Hellas, you were a Hellene. This is where we get words like Hellenization, okay? Now, now in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, it describes the acts of a foreign Greek uh, king, his name was Antiochus the Fourth. Antiochus the Fourth. Antiochus the Fourth um, was a, was a really really bad person. He was a really really bad king. Um, later tonight on my timeline, I'll post um, some something that I wrote up about how he was actually a foreshadow of the Antichrist, the Antichrist that's coming. Um, he was a really really bad person. Um, he um, essentially, well, I'll just read it to you. Um, so many, many Israelites were exiled in Greece because of, because of this king, this particular king, um, and because of the, his army, his Maccabe, the Maccabean army um, exiled a lot of uh, Israelites to Greece. Now, a lot of um, Israelites also fled to Greece or fled to like surrounding areas around Greece um, because of this war. That's what the Maccabean Revolt was about. Um, in December, um, it's... the Okay, so the world calls it Hanukkah. 
but it's actually called the Feast of Dedication. And so the Feast of, the Feast of Dedication actually goes back to this period. Um, so a lot of the Greeks, or excuse me, a lot of the Israelites, or if you want to say Jews, they were scattered um, during this time. A lot of them were also put to death. Um, and so what a lot of Hebrew Israelites are doing is they are um, essentially saying that... Um, when when scripture speaks about Gentiles, that it's it is speaking about um, Israelites, but from other tribes, but that's actually not the case. And I'm gonna break it down and show you. The problem with that doctrine is Galatia was not in Greece. Okay, G Galatia um, is was actually what is today known as Turkey. Galatia, according to Strong's, was an ancient area in the highlands or the central part of Anatoly. Anatoly roughly corresponds to modern-day Turkey, okay? So a lot of Israelites are, are wrong. Uh, you know, I hate this, but a lot of Israelites are wrong about this because it's it's telling you right then and there that, you know, where you're thinking Greece was or Helene was, it actually, it wasn't, you know, they, they were far reaching. And so a question to ask yourself is how could, how could scripture be speaking about the inhabitant, inhabitant and inhabitant of Greece or a Greek who speaks Greek when Galatia is actually in Turkey? I mean, that's that's a pretty straightforward question. So then we've got to go with, well, what's the meaning of Gentile? Okay, so remember this passage, Gal Galatians 3.28, actually, you know, in some translations it says Gentile, or sometimes it's implied. What happens is that, unfortunately, neither doctrine is 100% solid. So the Christians don't have it right, but the Hebrew Israelites don't have it right. There's, But there's, there's an in-between, okay? What I want to prove to you is that Scripture is actually saying that the, the true meaning of Jew nor Greek, you know, it, it has a, a deeper meaning. Okay, so Strong's Concordance, Concordance says that the definition of Greek or, you know, they, they essentially say it's a non-Jew. Non-Jew is, or a non-Jew is the, is essentially Strong's definition of, of a Greek, Okay. The fact that it refers to a person, a Gentile, as a non-Jew or a Greek as a non-Jew usually means, or when they're saying it, they're usually saying that they, they are a non-Israelite, okay? So it's it's really kind of synonymous because if a person is a, a Greek, you know, they're saying that this person isn't affiliated with the national, you know, the national origin of being a Jew, not who we think are Jews today. The the Jews that are in Israel today are actually converts. They're Jews by conversion. But when Strong's is telling you, it's saying the people with the you know the actual descendants, the people that were blood that are blood Jews. You know what I mean, blood Hebrews. Now, a lot of Hebrew Israelites will use passages in Matthew ten six and Matthew fifteen twenty four when dealing with salvation. They'll say that um, salvation is is of the Jews. It's for the Jews. It, you know, only they can be saved, or in their minds, only they can be saved. But what these passages actually mean is that um, the Messiah came to actually restore His people to the covenant, um, and also to be a light to the Gentiles. So these passages aren't actually saying that salvation is only for a certain group of people or only a certain ethnic ethnic group of people. This these two passages are taken out of context. Of course John 316 is also taken out of context. And so unfortunately like a lot of Israelites aren't they're they're just not understanding that. That's not what this means. So when Christ came to restore the covenant amongst his people he also wanted to be a light to the Gentiles. So in Isaiah 42, it talks about 
um, Israel being a light to the Gentiles, like basically leading them to him through like the way that they live and showing, you know, you know, being the people of the earth that, that show the goodness of, of him. Right. But what happened was Israel defaulted. They didn't, you know, they didn't keep their end of the bargain. Okay. Um, now when Christ ascended, his Messiah is actually carried on his work. They became the light of the world by spreading the, the, Basora or the good news to the nations. They fulfilled Isaiah chapter 42. <clears throat> so, in short, the answer to this, or to simplify this, is that Gentiles can receive salvation and they can be grafted in by faith. So, in this instance, Christians actually are right. However, they are wrong about the means about how they are grafted in. Um, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of Christians, unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't understand what it really means to be grafted in. Second Peter chapter one, verse 20 says, knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So unfortunately, most Christians don't want to follow or understand true prophecy. They use scripture to benefit themselves, which is really kind of a bad thing. A lot of Christians don't understand that they rule this age. So when I say that the earth is ruled, it, it's in a Gentile rule, it means that um, Christ is not seated on the throne here on this side of, of, of the veil. Okay, So he's in heaven, you know, seated next to the Father or standing next to the Father, um, according to Acts, the book of Acts. Um, but he, he the, the thousand year millennial kingdom has not been established yet, okay? So by default, the, the governments of the world are run by Gentiles. They, these are Gentile governments, again, even Israel, even modern day Israel, because th they are converts. And so, Gentiles won't rule the next age. The next age, which is a thousand years, will actually be recompensed and it'll go back to Israelite. The, the government of the earth will be Israelite and it'll be on Christ's shoulders. That's why everybody will keep the feast. That's why everybody will, um, you know, have to obey the Sabbath. That's why, um, you know, Gentiles will essentially be taking a back seat and learning. It won't be the way that it is now. Okay, so in the next the next age, the Israelites reign and rule with Christ, and the Gentiles take a back seat. They learn they learn about Messiah and they learn about His people, um, because again, you know, unfortunately, a lot of Christian doctrine, you know, it it's unfortunately is looped in with Freemasonry, and it just it hasn't really it hasn't really done justice the way that it you know it was a good thing because, you know, they got in on the promise, but there was some abuse that came when they got in on the promise. And so the next stage is rectifying that. However, um, many Hebrew Israelites are using the scripture as revenge. Like they're, they aren't, they're, they're blocking salvation or cutting off salvation. Um, you know, scripture, the Messiah says in the New Testament, he says, to the Pharisees, you know, you're blocking the kingdom of heaven, you're shutting it up, and you're not letting yourselves go in because you're not living right, and then you're not letting others go in. You know, you're, you're letting others um, miss the opportunity to see me and to experience me. Um, it was never supposed to be exclusive. This was never supposed to be an exclusive thing, it never supposed to be an exclusive blessing, um, but unfortunately, because of the way that things happened and things transpired, um, things that were activated with the, the curses of Deuteronomy 28, um, you know, there are some things that are off kilter with both Israelites and um, Gentiles. But the next, the next age, the coming age, is going to rectify that. So in summary, salvation is for all. We are all saved by grace or favor through faith. We are not saved by who we are or by our lineage. Okay. 
tonight, this was a tough teaching, um, but I felt it was needed. It was delivered in love. I did the best that I could to, to really present this in a way that was love um, or loving. But it was a tough teaching, tough topic. Of course, we, we need to finish this. There's got to be more to this. Um, next week, I want to talk about uh, what it means to be grafted in. I also want to talk about um, what salvation or the difference in salvation, like between what, you know, how is salvation different for a Greek or a Gentile versus a, a Jew or an Israelite? Because uh, there are several definitions several, or several meanings of salvation in the scriptures, and there's like four or five different meanings of salvation, you know, the, what salvation essentially means in scripture, and it means different things to different people. And so we're going to break that down. Um, you know, what does salvation mean for a Gentile versus an Israelite? And then what does it mean to be grafted in? You know, you've got the natural, natural branch, you know, the natural vine, and then you've got the, you know, the wild that's, that's, you know, grafted in or sown in. So we're going to talk about that um, because it is important. These are, you know, this is something that is is relevant, that is happening, you know, in real time. You know, things are happening so quickly and people don't really grasp or understand what these passages mean. And so when you tell people, you know, hey, this is what Jacob's trouble is about, what, you know, the great tribulation or Jacob's trouble is about this. This is the reason why it's happening. This is who it'll who who it will affect, and this is what happens after it ends. After Jacob's trouble ends, comes the next age, the thousand-year millennial reign. Okay, what does that mean? What does it mean when I say the Israelites are going to be reigning? Right. Also, what does it mean, you know, for the identity of Christ? So these are some things that um, we definitely want to continue talking about. This was important. I want to delay the groundwork. Um, just some scripture passages. I'll, I'll put the, the scripture passages that I came from tonight in the body of this post. Um, again, go back and listen to this. Um, again, it's not saying, you know, anybody who calls upon the name of the Most High can be saved. And I think a lot of people feel like, you know, only Israelites can be saved or only Christians can be saved, or, you know, only certain ethnic groups can be saved. And that's just simply not true. Um, there's, there's so much to this and so many people are taking this and they're warping it and, and taking it out of context. They're not telling the truth. They are hurting people. They're closing up the kingdom is what is what the Messiah said. Uh, to the Pharisees, and people need to know that this is this is not cool. You know, he does not approve of this. Uh, anybody, in fact, anybody teaching that only certain groups of people can be saved, certain ethnicities of people can be saved, they they are in danger of hellfire. And so, it's very very important that um, we don't um, lean towards this, and that we get an understanding that you know anybody who repents and calls on the name of the of the most high can be saved there's there's no respecter of person in terms of salvation okay um, now there is favor um, again you know the, the the next age to come is an Israelite you know it's you know it's um, the, the future is Israelite okay but um, that doesn't mean that others can't be a part of it. And so I want you to go back. You can re-listen to this as much as you want to or much as or, or as little as you'd like to. Um, I want you to really get a, to grasp this, to get an understanding. I'm going to post some more things tonight, um, just some more scripture passages and uh, some information on um, uh, King Antiochus IV, um, who is a, he's an important figure in Israelite history. Um, again, his Antichrist spirit will be making a debut on the earth very soon. And so I want you to read up on him and study up on him. 
And then next week, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to continue this topic. Um, again, it'll be focused more on what does it mean to be grafted in, and it will also be on um, the difference the differences, both the differences and the similarities in salvation and what those mean for Israelites and what those mean for Gentiles. Thank you so much. I'm Walter Lovett signing off.